All right, can everyone see that? Cool, and everybody can hear me? And welcome, coming to you live from the Loadmaster, the Chief Loadmaster's office in 22nd Air Squadron. I am uh, Master Sergeant Kurt Nemechek. Uh, today we're gonna talk a little bit about EPR system. Um, the main focus is gonna be uh, on tech sergeants for the 2020 uh, cycle and uh, kind of their reports and what to look at, but um, this, these principles apply to everyone. Some things may be a little different. So if you have any questions or anything, feel free to speak up. This is more of a discussion than a lecture. So if you have any questions or comments at any point, uh, go ahead and ask. And at the end, we'll have some time for some questions and stuff like that. So we'll also go over some examples and things like that. So looking forward, looking for your guys' input, your thoughts, uh, and then also um, any sort of comments that you have uh, along the way. So Chuck, uh, Sergeant Collins is uh, in a meeting, so he's not going to be be with us. He may join us later, but right for right now, uh, I am riding solo. So um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So this is what we're going to talk about. Um, so biggest things, we're going to talk about some just intro stuff, some EPR basics. Uh, then we'll get into effective uh, writing, some bullet development, uh, some attention to detail, some of the things that we're seeing that guys are missing. Um, while they're doing working on their reports and sorry i gotta for some reason i have to admit people into the room okay i don't know what's going on is there anybody else i can admit somebody to the room there it goes Okay, sorry about that. For some reason, it makes me admit everyone to the room. Yeah, there might be a setting. I can't, I, I never host rooms, but I, I think it's like you can turn off the waiting room if that's a... Yeah, it, it's in there, but uh, it's like grayed out. It won't let me change it. Oh, I see. Maybe it's because it's already created. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know if I can make somebody else the host just so they can admit some people. Um, let's see, Eric, are you there? I'm going to make you the host with the most. What's going on? It says hosting. Never mind. Uh, sorry, the technical difficulties. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get back into it. So I apologize for that. Oh man. All these people join it late. Okay. Somebody else has the ability to, to let some people in. Uh, feel free. Okay. Damn it. Excuse me. Excuse my language. Anybody's good at technology. All right. Sorry for the delay. Here we go. Back to what we were talking about um, previously. Um, so just just go over some things, some common mistakes that people make, and then we'll get into some examples. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have some time for some questions and stuff like that. So uh, biggest thing is why, why are we here? Uh, what, what, do we, what do we do this for, right? So the whole point is to manage some expectations, set standards, uh, provide some clear communication, provide uh, feedback for everyone, right? So if you are doing something and you're doing it wrong the whole time and you never understand wh why you're doing it wrong or what you're doing wrong, and they're going to continue to make the same mistakes. So the goal is to provide some feedback. Also simplify the process, right? When we talk about EPRs, bullet writing, and things like that, a lot of people procrastinate to the very end. And a lot of the reason is they don't know the process. They don't know um, kind of what to look for. And so they, they delay to the very end. Um, and then 
it makes the process a little bit more difficult. So if we can simplify things, make uh, break down some of those barriers, uh, and then along the way, uh, it'll make it easier for everyone. Uh, and then also, we're always looking to get better, right? It doesn't matter if you've been in the Air Force for a year or 30 years, there's always room for improvement. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, and then answer any questions that folks may have uh, about the whole process. So just getting into the basic EPR flow, what it, what it should look like. Um, so it should start with you and your supervisor, right? So why do we say the RADI? Uh, if you look at the reg, everyone always says, well, it's my supervisor's responsibility to write my EPR. True, that is correct. But the biggest thing is we want to make sure that you take control of your career, right? No different than if you're in training, you want to be in control of your training program. Uh, you want to be in control of your career. Because if you let somebody else steer it, it may go in a direction that you don't want. So you want to have control over your career and be able to kind of steer it the way, way you want. So that's why it's important for the RAD, uh, the individual, to have some sort of input buy-in uh, on their report and not just have their supervisor write it. So that's why it's developed by the RAD and the supervisor. From there, it's going to go to your additional rater. Your additional rater is going to be um, an E7 or above, and then it's got to be uh, your raider's raider. Um, at the same time, it's going to go through your flight supervision. From there, it's going to go to your chief uh, loadmaster or flight engineer. Squadron superintendent, first sergeant will do like a quality of force review, the execs, and then uh, signed eventually by the commander. Any questions on the basics? Okay. So now uh, when you talk about writing an EPR, how does it how does it make everyone feel, Scott? How do you feel like? What does it make you feel like when you write an EPR? Or we talk uh, about EPRs. <laughs> I feel like a lot for Yeah, I think these uh these uh pictures sum it up pretty well. Especially we don't do any pre planning. <laughs> yeah, right. Everyone gets frustrated. Everyone's like, oh, I hate talking about it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to work on it anymore. All right, and it leads to a lot of frustration. Uh, maybe anger or uh, whatever. So our goal here is to kind of crack that code, um, figure out the easiest way to do it. And um, the thing about writing an EPR or writing bullets or whatever, it's a perishable skill. So it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, it changes year to year, right? Regulations change, leadership changes, and over, the, over time, um, you have to adapt your style and your skill um, for that new um, that new that new writing style. So not not only does the writing style and everything change, it's a very perishable skill, right? So if you're not using it every day, you lose some some touch touch with that. So it's important to stay engaged, uh, keep abreast of any changes that are coming out and things like that. So we can eliminate some of this frustration when we get to uh, talking about writing EPRs. Okay, so next. The question we ask is why is effective writing important? And I underline and highlight the word effective, right? So writing obviously is important, but effective writing is the most important, right? So uh, what kind of message am I able to, to convey, right? The better you're able to write and the more effective your communication is, the uh, greater impact that your, your words are going to have. So um, when we talk about a bullet, what does a bullet do? Why do we do it? Uh, it provides a word picture of the individual, right? So it en enables an evaluation of that of your performance without knowing the person, right? So when you talk about promotions, you talk about um, DSDs or special duties, they look at your package, basically your, your reports, and they look at it from a basically purely paper standpoint. I'm just reading who you are, what you do on paper. And the better you can portray that, on paper, the more likely you are to get picked up for a special duty, uh, get selected for promotion, things like that. So that's why it's so important. Uh, and that's why we harp on it um, nonstop. It's, it's important for, for everyone for their career to uh, make sure that what, what they do, their accomplishments are accurately captured, right? So we've all seen it to where somebody who does a little bit less work, maybe get recognized more or get highlighted more uh, for something that they did when the person working hard isn't getting recognized. And a lot of times it's because their their reports or their awards or whatever don't reflect the things that they're doing. So making sure that we accurately capture 
what they do uh, is, is super important. And then the last piece is kind of telling your story, right? Uh, what, what you do on the jet uh, doesn't matter if you can't um, talk about it and you can't um, project that, that, that message in that image, right? So um, make sure that you're getting that, that uh, story across. All right, excuse me for one second. I think I let somebody in. Okay, so next thing is knowing your audience. This is this is huge. Uh, let me pick on somebody else. Bechtel, why is it important that you know your audience? Well, you wanna make sure you're appealing to what they value, so your audience, I mean, isn't just your peers, but it's also your supervision and what they value. So what that commander's intent might be or how you're achieving it. Yeah, so also you, you wanna be able to communicate to, with them, right? So it's like, if you're speaking a different language than somebody, if they don't understand what you're trying to say, and when I say language, talk about acronyms, right? If I use like APU, ATM, or, or something along those lines, they may not understand what you're trying to say, right? So it's like being able to communicate with them is, is super important because if they don't understand it, they're just throwing their hands up. Either they think it's super important or they, they dis discredit and disvalue because they don't understand what you're trying to say, right? And so when I say this, it's important to have other people look at your reports um, and also know who your audience is uh, when, when you're writing these reports. So you know, hey, who am I targeting? What language do they speak? How do I com communicate this to them so they'll understand it? Um, so it depends on uh, who, who you're writing for, right? So let's say for tech sergeants, right? So that's the focus of this, um, this group. For tech sergeants, in the 22nd for 2020, we're gonna be a small unit. What does that mean, small unit? That means force distribution is not gonna be determined within the squadron. That means it has to go up to the wing, right? So when it goes up to the wing, you're looking at people from medical, you're looking at, you know, maybe some security forces or uh, some support services or whatever the case may be, people that don't speak aviation, they don't speak ops, they don't speak C5, all those types of things. So when you're writing these reports, you got to make sure that you can uh, speak in a manner to where they will understand you. Um, and then when it gets down to it, so we talk about what language they speak as much as possible, if you can speak in plain language, right? Something that anybody else can understand. It's, it's very important. And that's where we get in, that's huge, we're for the peer mentor review, right? So if you have somebody, uh, let's say for example, if it's gonna be an ops uh, board. So if it's somebody from ops, you want other people from ops. So if I'm a flight engineer, I want a load master to look at, I want a boom operator to look at, I want other people in within the operations community to look at it and, be, and ask them like, hey, when you read this, does it make sense to you? Can you understand what I'm trying to communicate to you? Uh, and then the same thing where when we get the, the tech sergeants for this, sorry, let me somebody in. The tech sergeants for the wing board, they gotta be able to speak to dental and they gotta be able to speak to, uh, you know, services, those types of things. So have people from that community sit down and read it for you. If you have friends or peers, or you know, if you're going to five, six, or top three, or whatever, have those people from that community to look at it and ask them, hey, when you read this, does, do you understand it? Does it make sense to you? What kind of impact do you feel this provides? Do you think this is significant, or do you think this is kind of something that can be overlooked? Questions on that? Okay. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah. So is it uh, for the bullet, right? So you're talking about uh, making it so that your audience could understand it. Would that, would it be a preferred technique to uh, uh, minimize the acronyms and abbreviation and just, you know, spell out everything for, if you can? Absolutely. Uh, and we're going to get into some of those tips and tricks and things like that. Um, but that's one of the points is like, hey, minimize those acronyms. You're saying APU, ATM, uh, I don't know, any one of those litany of uh, acronyms, 
if they can't understand that, or if they have to read the acronym and they don't understand, like, hey, I don't know what an ATM is, um, you know, and they have to go to the acronym list, most likely they're not even going to go to, they're just going to ignore it and they're going to move on. So it's important to uh, minimize those acronyms as much as possible and speak in plain language that people can, people can understand, like, right? So, like, if your parents read it, can they, you know, understand that or, or have your wife read it or whatever, husband, you know, if they read that, does it make sense to them? Um, so you get some different perspective. Okay, another little piece about knowing your audience. So um, like we said earlier, this is focused on tech sergeants going for, for uh, master. So when you look at the master uh, board formal charge, just, uh, let me pick on somebody. Jake, I'll pick on you uh, since you're a tech sergeant. Um, you know what, where to find this, what this document is, the Mass Army Board formal charge? I, not gonna lie to you, I actually don't. Yeah, and, and that's the reason we're doing this, right? So uh, to kind of teach a little bit about this, have some understanding. So the formal charge is a document that's read to all the board members, right? So when your records go up for promotion, you have a board that's gonna sit there and look at your records, right? Before they look at your records, they're going to get this formal charge. The formal charge is going to basically walk them through. These are the things that you're looking for when you review those reports. And it's important that we understand that because they're asking these questions. Hey, how's this person in job performance? How's this person in professional uh, competence, leadership, job responsibility, breadth of experience, awards, decorations? They're asking you these questions, right? And so it's important when you write your report to answer those questions, right? Hey, uh, this is how I do in job performance. This is how I do in uh, professional competence. Uh, so I'll read you a little excerpt out of that uh, board brief. That kind of where this comes from. So it says, in determining who is best qualified for, for promotion, you will use the whole person concept, giving careful consideration to such factors as job performance, professional competence, leadership, job responsibility, breadth of experience, awards and decorations. And then it goes on to say, among these factors, job performance is most important and must be the primary factor used when evaluating potential to serve in the next higher grade, right? So that's why uh, we have on here a, a big asterisk um, on job performance. That's the, the area that carries the most weight, right? Um, and when we talk about it, most recent job performance, right? So whatever's on top, whatever that top EPR is, how you did on that carries the most weight, right? And as it goes further down, it carries less and less weight. Does that make sense to you, Jake? Does that help a little? Yeah, solid. Yeah, I remember seeing the email for it and I, I did read through a little bit of it, but yeah, the name of it and where to find it, couldn't tell you where, where, where to actually find it. Okay. Yeah, so that's how I'm gonna get into the next piece. I got a little, uh, just a little slide to show you, show you kind of where where it's at. Um, just one other thing I want to read to you from the board brief. Uh, it says, in an attempt to find a discriminator between records, right? So that's what we're all trying to do. We're trying to uh, discriminate between each other. We're trying to distinguish ourselves amongst our peers. Caution should be used, avoiding placing undue emphasis on any one factor or statement, right? So it's saying like, hey, you don't want to be just really good at one job, one area, you wanna be you know, a whole person, well-rounded. Uh, it says, however, job performance must remain the primary factor. It's imperative that you score records based on proven leadership performance and future potential to serve in the next higher grade, right? So it's like, hey, are you fulfilling the roles of a tech sergeant? And then do you have, or are, are, you, are you already serving in the next uh, higher role? Are you already acting in, and performing as a master. Okay, so the next piece, Jake, you said, how do I get it? Where do I get it from? Uh, where is this document, right? So it's the master Sergeant formal board charge, right? And then they have it for, for senior and chief as well, but we're focused today on tech sergeants. So here it is in MyPERS, right? So if you log into MyPERS, on the left-hand side, you can see where it says promotion. Uh, and then in there, it'll, it'll say uh, formal board charge. You click on it and it comes to this screen. So you can see in the center here, it says formal board charges, right? Um, calendar year 19, chief master sergeant, calendar year 20, senior master sergeant, and their calendar year 20 master sergeant. So every year they come up with a new 
uh, a new board uh, formal charge, right? So it's mostly the same document every year, but at the bottom, it'll have a little summary that says like, hey, this is what changed from last year. So you get an idea. So if you've already read it, you're familiar with it, you can go down to the bottom and just say like, hey, what's changed from, from last year? And give you a quick, quick synopsis of that. Any questions on that, where to get it or anything like that? Okay, cool. So now that we've talked about, we know what we're asking for, right? We know what, what they're asking for, what they're looking for. Now we want to answer those questions, right? And we need to answer it in a matter of saying like, hey, how am I meeting those things and what level am I performing at, right? So for the for an NCO, they're per, uh, performing at the supervisory level, right? So they're, sorry, let me get rid of this thing. Get away from him right here. Uh, Anyways, efforts in, uh, should be tactical, operational, right? They should be at that level. Uh, and then they should be at a, basically at a small team level. Excuse me. Somebody's joining. I apologize for that, it's, uh, it's annoying. Okay, back to it. Um, okay, so we talked about the NCO supervisory level is at the tactical operational level, right? Um, performance considered a NCO contribution, right? So you should see key words like supervise, lead, take charge, right? They should be focusing on small teams, right? Um, you know, less, less than 10, let's say, um, you know, four to five is probably ideal. Working on programs, they should be receiving some sort of mid-level recognition, right? something in the squadron, maybe a group quarterly, right? A, a coin from headquarters. Um, their whole person concept, right? Should be um, kind of more uh, long-term education, training opportunities, right? Um, so you talk about CCF, right? Knocking that thing out, maybe even moving on to a bachelor's degree. Uh, and their involvement in the community, things like that should be more at the supervisor lead level, uh, taking charge of events instead of uh, just kind of being a contributor. Uh, on the converse side of that, right, when we talk about airmen, airmen are at the membership level. So there should be more along the lines of uh, assist and aid and things like that, and not taking charge of events. If they do, that's even above and beyond. But the expectation is just be involved. And if you guys have any questions along the way, stop me at any point. So. Um, I won't, I won't ask if you have any questions unless you, let's just speak up, but, uh, okay. So when you develop a bullet, what is a, what do you do when you develop a bullet? And this is one of the biggest pieces that sometimes people struggle with. You want to answer any questions, right? So if I read a bullet, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, should be anything left to question. I shouldn't say like, well, how many people was that or what the impact was, right? So when you start developing a bullet, you want to do some fact finding, right? So the who, what, when, where, why. Um, you want to be make sure you identify some sort of quality, right? Was it the best? Was it the most successful? Was it the first? Is it a benchmark? Things like that. Quantify it with numbers, right? So uh, number of people, number of or percentage, uh, money, things like that, right? So cost of things, right? It's cost savings, man hours, for, uh, resources, right? So the bottom line is numbers matter and you want to answer those questions uh, in the report so there's never any questions and it makes it more impactful right if you just say let a team well it's like is a team two people or is a team ten people those types of things you want to answer those questions um and then at the end research to find find the right answers right don't don't take the lazy approach take the right approach find the the right answer uh for those things if you're unsure a lot of times you know websites google things like that will, will help find you you the answer to the kind of the ultimate conclusion, whether it be an event or a mi operational mission, stuff like that. Okay, so then once you gather all the facts, uh, this is how it goes. Air Force always talks about action, impact, result. What is, what's an impact? What's a result? I don't know. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for um, 16 years, uh, writing EPRs and stuff, and I still confused on like, what, what's an impact? What's a result? So, to simplify things, the easiest way you can think about it is like what you did, how you did it, 
and then why it matters in the end, right? So if you, if you get too much into the action impact results, sometimes it can be confusing, but to simplify things, just say like, hey, what did you do? How did you do it? And then at the end, why it matters, what's the bigger impact, right? And I always try to think um, bigger, right? What uh, we're gonna get into like asking the five whys, but when you can go up to a higher level, uh, then it's gonna make it more impactful. Okay, let's talk about some do's and don'ts when you're writing bullets. Uh, always use single bullets. Uh, back in the day, we used to use sub bullets. You have one bullet and then like below that, you had like two sub bullets, um, but we're, we got rid of all that. So uh, I think everyone knows by now, uh, always using single bullets. Avoid any sort of kind of fluffy, feel good phrases, uh, things that make you feel good, but aren't factual and aren't rooted in um, actual things I can, like tangible things that I can attach to where it's like uh, something that just like kind of um, makes somebody feel good. We want to make sure that it's actual facts and that those are going to be the, the harder hitting things as well. Uh, avoid lead-ins. Lead they don't provide anything. It's almost the same thing where it's a fluffy thing, right? So if you say hard charger, my best airman, things like that, they don't really add to uh, any value to the, the bullet. So try to avoid those things. A uh, big thing is kind of figuring out that puzzle, right? Uh, making sure that that bullet is the correct length to where you avoid as much white space at the end as possible. Because people can see that and say like, oh, there's all this space at the end. Uh, regardless of what the bullet says, they can devalue that bullet by saying like, oh, you didn't leave it at the end. So try to eliminate as much white space as possible. And the biggest thing is be accurate, right? So be accurate. It makes it fair across the board. Uh, and especially if a guy's, um, you know, competing against each other, you want to make sure that their records accurately reflect what they did so that the right person gets the credit that they deserve. Uh, and then some bullet basics. Um, Hubble, as you mentioned earlier, avoiding those excessive abbreviations and acronyms, right? So you can speak in plain language that people can understand. Um, that way your message is being communicated and getting across. Um, your language needs to support the rating, right? So if you're saying, uh, I delivered some cargo, I met COCOM requirements or whatever, when you see meets and you look at the EPR, meets is right down the middle, right? So you want to make sure that you're not using language that aligns with one of those ratings, right? So if you're exceeding the standards, you want to say that you're exceeding the standards, not that you met the standard. Um, so make sure that the language is supporting the rating that you're that you have. Uh, so, and if you ever talk about the squadron level, right, so you don't have to say squadron unit, this and that, a lot of times that, that's automatically assumed, right? If your EPR is closing out at the squadron, that is already assumed, so you don't have to say that. So you can save some space so you can fit more in there, um, so you can, you know, tell your story a little, a little bit better, a little bit clearer, use a few more words by cutting out some of the, the extra. Just some basics, um, verbs just need to be in the past tense, right? Because this is a report of um, accomplishments already, right? These are things you've already done, not things that are going to happen in the future or things that are happening. So all of it needs to be in past tense. Uh, so if you if you go to um, any sort of professional military education, ALS, NCO Academy, you can't include that on the report unless that person won an individual award, right? Team awards and things like that don't count. That's straight out of the, the reg. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. Um, so just some consistency. So if you abbreviate a word, it should be abbreviated that same way throughout. Um, and if you spell it out, same thing, right? Make sure that you spell that word out throughout the whole uh, report. Uh, the only exception really is the uh, word for. So a lot of times you'll see F slash for for. Uh, per the current ops group commander, he doesn't um, like the, the use of the F slash as much, so we try to limit it as much as possible. You can still use it, he just doesn't want to see it every bullet, the F slash. Um, so you can have a few of those where it's F slash and then four in there as much as possible, but try to spell out four as much as possible. Uh, and then if you're going to use an abbreviation, right, so sometimes it allows you to use uh, the example here is training, T-R-N-G for training or T-N-G for training. You can use either one, but it has to be consistent throughout, right? So if you use T-R-N-G, it should be that way throughout the whole, the whole report 
or same thing with TNG. And then here's the big one. Don't use the same word over and over again. A lot, a lot of them, uh, I guess some examples here, airlifted, delivered, enabled, bolsters. That's one of uh, Sergeant Zalonis laughing because he knows he loves to use that word. Uh, you don't use those same words over and over and over again because it, it takes away, it lessens your impact, right? So you want to get creative uh, with some of these things and look for synonyms for some of those same, same words, right? A lot, enable is a big one. It's like at the end of the bullet, everybody enabled something. So try to come up with one enabled is okay, uh, um, but it shouldn't be at the end of every bullet. Um, and then just uh, the next one, if you say selected for something, right, this is going along the lines of quantifying it. Who selected you? What is, you know, uh, if, if you just say selected, it could have been, right, my, my buddy selected me. And that, doesn't, that takes away from some of the impact. So if you want to highlight that it was selected, say that who selected them, right? Was it selected by the squadron commander, the group commander, right? Somebody, somebody high up. If you're saying selected, it means something. So say who selected you. But if it's not that impactful, then you should probably just get rid of that. Uh, another one, uh, use active voice, not passive voice, right? So you wouldn't say uh, 10,000 pounds of cargo delivered. You would say delivered 10,000 pounds of cargo, right? So use active voice, not passive voice. Any, any questions on that? I know for me, I struggle with active and passive voice. What is active voice? What does passive voice mean? All right, I'll take silence as uh, everybody understands. Okay, so now just some of the uh, basics when you're writing some of these bullets. Uh, focus on scope of responsibility, right? Ask yourself why, right? So try to think to the next level. So if you're going through those things, right? If you think of the squadron impact, that's great. Did it have enough impact at the group? Did it have an impact at the wing? Did it have an impact? at the numbered Air Force, uh, AMC. Uh, right, is a, ask yourself those five whys, right? So if you say, um, hey, we did this, we accomplished this mission, right? And then you say, but why? Because, um, you know, the squadron told me to, but why? Well, because we got a sign from TACC, but why, right? And then just kind of keep going down. So ask yourself that question and get to the bigger picture at the end. When we talk about bullets, right? Next thing I want to say is like you want to focus on individual accomplishments versus a team, right? So it's like a, a lot of them you see are flying bullets, like the, the team accomplishes, the team delivered this cargo. But what you want to emphasize is what you as an individual did to help make that team accomplishment happen, right? So it's like, hey, if I'm the primary loadmaster on this mission, you know, how did I? organize and lead this, you know, my load master team or my load team, um, you know, how did I coordinate personnel and things like that. I want to focus on my accomplishments, right, to help the team accomplish our goal, right? And that's a big thing too. I think we're going to get into it a little later, so I'll, I'll mention it then, but um, making sure that you, you capture your full scope of responsibility. So. Uh, next, okay, ask yourself, how, how does this demonstrate uh, if the person is suited for the next hire period, right? So that's what kind of the question that we always want to be answering, right? Proven leadership performance, so we mentioned it earlier, right, from the board brief, proven leadership performance and future potential to serve in the next hire period, right? So you want to make sure that when you're writing these bullets, it's demonstrating how I'm ready or how I'm already serving in that next hire grade. Come on in, Chuck. Chuck's joining us. Now we get the true insight. You want to sit over here? Yeah. Join the join the picture. All right. Uh, okay. Say hello, Chuck. Everybody. Hey, everybody. Uh, okay. So um, we talked about including any uh, subordinate or team accomplishments, right? So if I'm a supervisor over somebody and they win a quarterly award because I wrote the package for them, or they get promoted. Uh, they get a DSD, OTS, BTZ. That's my accomplishment as well, right? Because I helped them get to that point. So make sure that you capture that uh, to make sure to say like, hey, I led this team and this team achieved this award or we made this happen or whatever. So if you're leading that team, make sure that you're capturing, capturing that piece of it. 
I know, I know a lot of times you think, well, that's his, his accomplishment, his, his award or whatever, but without you writing those bullets or writing that package or pushing in, in a mentoring them in a certain direction, they don't achieve that, right? So uh, make sure that as a supervisor or a, a NCYC as a section leader, you're capturing those things. Uh, here's a big one I see a lot. For some reason at Travis, we like to use the apostrophe D. So um, you can use that. I, I would caution you on using it excessively. Um, if you need that one little space and the bullet is perfect, sure, go ahead and use it. Um, but the rule when you're using it, so verbs ending in a consonant may not use apostrophe as, uh, right? So what does that mean? So we use the example of push, right? So push, the, the word push ends with an H, right? So H is a consonant. So you cannot use the ID for that. Dollars coming in here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think I said cannot. You can use it for that, right? So if you use push and ends with an H, right, you can use the apostrophe D. But if it ends in, an, uh, in a vowel, right, ending in an E, you uh, do not use the apostrophe, right? The example here is enhance. Because there would normally be an E in enhance. You cannot use the apostrophe D for that. Does that make sense? And the reason this is limited is just anything that makes your EPR harder to read is going to take away from the value of the content that's on there. So the easier it is to read, the less someone has to look up acronyms or abbreviations, the faster they can get to your package. Great point. Okay, so here's what we were kind of talking about, alluding to earlier. Include all personnel you have influence over, right? So if you're the NCOI of the, of the crew, right? You have influence, you have responsibility of, over, you know, let's say an average of three flight engineer, four load master, an FCC, right? And at the same time, you're advising the aircraft commander. You're advising those, you're, right? you're coordinating with all these different agencies, whether it be billeting or, um, you know, weather, ATOC, people like that, right? So make sure that you're capturing the full scope of, your responsibility while you're out there on the road. Uh, you know, if you're a primary primary load master, um, focus on the people that you're uh, directly responsible, right? Three-ish, maybe even more uh, load masters, coordinating with ATOC, coordinating with, uh, you know, the Army and ground support personnel, right? You can talk about joint operations or if you're doing something for NATO, right? You're getting into the kind of uh, combined operations, so uh, make sure that you're capturing capturing all that. Well, no, that's perfect. <clears throat> and then the last piece is like so. Uh, we talk about we'll, we'll get into uh, looking at the actual EPR itself, but uh, uh, make sure that when you have those key duties that it says that you do that you're responsible for. Those that's where it lays out. Hey, these are all the things that you're responsible for. Make sure that you have a bullet there to to uh, support it, right? Make sure you have a bullet in there that says like hey, that's what you're responsible for, and this is what you did with that, right? So make sure you have something in there that says that. All right, now we talk about finishing them, kind of polishing, polishing the end product, making sure it stands out. Yeah, that uh, waiting room thing is killing me. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing, you don't want to, uh, some of these things to get lost in, right? So when we talk about uh, an award, I would always put your award at the very beginning of that bullet, right? So make it stand out, make it, make people recognize that, right? So if you hide it at the end, sometimes it can be lost. I just was on a uh, awards board recently and reviewing all these packages and uh, there was a tie between two folks and they were going back and forth and uh, one of the members made a comment, it's like, oh, I didn't even realize he won that award because at the very end of that bullet, it said like, hey, this guy was uh, DG at NCO Academy or whatever. Uh, so that award was tucked in there and they didn't see that. And so it got lost. So if you bring that to the beginning, now it's makes it stand out and now it can see, hey, this guy won DG at NCOA. 
And then this is what he did to achieve that, right? So as much as you can, if you can put those in, in the front, it'll make it stand out. Yeah, that sort of self set, uh, helps set the tone for the bullet. Like you can see right away that that guy's crushing it without even looking at the meat of the bullet. So it's kind of like, that would be like one sentence and then you would still have your three part bullet next. All right, moving on a little bit with uh, finishing the bullets, right? As a supervisor, right? So whether it be a master sergeant rating on a tech or a tech rating on a, um, a staff sergeant or a staff sergeant rating on a senior or something like that, uh, make sure you're doing your due diligence when you're um, finalizing these reports. Uh, review their previous EPRs, right? Make sure they don't have the same bullet over and over again. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see the same bullet year after year, and that takes away from the accomplishments that these people are doing, right? So it's like people are working hard all year long. We want to make sure that we we capture that and make sure that we're we're recognizing these guys for the accomplishments that they're they're doing throughout the year. And if you just let them use the same bullet year after year after year, it's going to lessen the impact, right? So make sure we're recognizing these people properly. Take a look at their EPRs. Take a look look at their surf, right? Make sure that they're they're receiving or they're they're progressing, right? So if they're doing the same thing year in and year out, whether it be the same bullet or not, make sure that they're progressing, they're developing themselves. You are mentoring them. To, um, deliberately developing them making sure that you're saying hey you've done that in the past let's look at to move on to something else or you know move to a higher level within that same whether it be training or something like that um, show progression within there because uh, over the years they should be developing they should be progressing uh, and we need to make sure that we're capturing that on the report as well uh, these are just some examples uh, if you say they're working on the bs degree but they haven't finished their ccf right um, there's a question mark there. Why are they working on their BS degree if they haven't finished their CCF, right? Usually that's kind of the stepping stone. So ask those questions, engage with your folks, make sure that you're accurately capturing that. And if they're looking to progress in rank, right, CCF becomes a requirement um, when you're going from master to senior. So it should be one of those things that they should be achieving as well. So uh, most of the time, see, when you talk about CCF, all you have to do is those core classes. And if you're working on your bachelor's degrees, you got to do those anyway. So while you're working on your bachelor's degree, you can do your CCF along the way. So, uh, and then another thing we see a lot is, um, you know, guys that are like, hey, we moved this army unit or air force unit to wherever. And then you can, you know, Google that operation. It's like the wrong unit, uh, the, the wrong, right? The, what that unit is and what supplies they use don't match, don't line up, right? So just do some simple research. And, make sure that it's uh, accurate. You know. Yeah, and on that note too, sometimes like we've done well, I've done some research on people's EPRs and like, oh, I didn't even realize that they were part of that exercise or part of that mission once by seeing the unit and where they went. So you can tie those things together. And then also for a level of pro progression, it's the same thing. Like maybe one year you're a mentor or a member and next year you could be a, a president and just moving on up. Okay, here's the big one. Um, why we emphasize this so much is because, you know, as as the EPR progresses uh, throughout the uh, squadron, you want whoever's looking at it to spend the most time on improving it, making it better, and not, you know, correcting spelling errors or, you know, up, you're using the incorrect form or your AFSC isn't correct. So these types of things, right, making it as accurate as possible before you push it up is only going to help you because whoever's looking at next can spend more time enhancing it and improving it make sure they're accurately capturing what you're accomplishing versus you know correcting some minor minor little things so here's some of the things that we we see a lot of um a lot of errors with um the ready identif identification information right where it talks about hey this is uh you know your name social security number afsc things like that it has to match your shell report uh, let me pick on somebody. Uh, Solana says too easy. I'll even pick on you since I can see you. John, where do I get my shell report from? The shell report you get from your VPC site. Yep. All right. So if you once you uh, get your VPC site assigned to you, up in the upper right hand corner, there'll be an option to view um, your shell report. So if you click on that, that information all comes from LPBS. So if something on there is incorrect, 
you need to update the middle PDS, uh, and then you can pull a new shell report um, to make that match. But the most important thing is your EPR must match the shell report. So if something's incorrect, you have to get mil PDS updated, get a new shell report, and then match that to your EPR, right? So it's got to match them. Some other common things, spelling, right? The EPR, the, the, the report automatically um, looks for spelling errors, right? So if you see that red squiggly line under there, it's telling you there's a, a spelling error. A lot of times you'll see a million of those throughout the report because we're using acronyms, abbreviations, things like that. Um, but, but take a look at that, make sure that you're uh, looking for those spelling errors um, before you push it up. Because sometimes if you spell it incorrectly uh, and you need to add a letter in there, it pushes the, the bullet over and now it won't fit anymore, right? So now that bullet that you had crafted doesn't fit. So make sure that you're looking at those. Uh, your chain of command information is correct, right? So correct supervisor, correct additional raider, uh, and then commander information, all that kind of stuff is correct. We'll, we'll look at some of that a little bit. but. Um, so your raider obviously is your supervisor, and then your additional raider is going to be an E7 within your chain of command, and normally it's going to be your raider's uh, raider. Well, we talked about a little bit um, correct version of the form, right? At the very bottom of the report, your acronym list, making sure that's up to date. So as you, before you push it up, that should be kind of the last thing you need to look at, make sure that it's accurate and matches, and then. As you make changes or updates or corrections, go back and make sure that acronym list is, is still accurate. So the main thing is with this is every time it goes up the next level, you want that person to be able to spend their time adding value to your report and not spending time going over the, the little details that could have been accomplished at a lower level. Yeah, and some of the formatting things we'll see is like the name on the back of the report. It's not in all caps, right? The name has to be in all caps, and then um, the, the rank will be, uh, we'll get into that a little bit, but like normal rank structure, like tax chart, capital T, capital S, and then G, lowercase gt. Um, but the name is always going to be in all caps. So it's first name, middle initial, period, last name, all caps. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you an example of that. And then completely fill out the forms, right? So if there's, um, you know, like the future roles block, a lot of people will leave that blank. Uh, make sure you fill those out. Make sure you click all the boxes that, that are supposed to be filled out. Make sure you put in the, the raider's information. Don't leave, don't leave somebody else to do that. Make sure that you do it. If you don't know that information, ask somebody, right? Go to your supervisor, ask them. If they don't know that, ask a peer, ask uh, you know, somebody within your flight leadership, ask the question. One, it's going to educate you. Two, when you send the report up, it's going to be more filled out, like we said, and then the people who look at it can add value to that report. Okay, so here's uh, just kind of a basic, uh, here's John uh, L. Doe's uh, report, so you can see his name, all caps, um, and then if you look at the top under the name where it says name, last, first, middle, initial, you see that after the first, there's a comma. But then when you look at John's name, there's no comma, right? So that's the proper format, even though above it, it, it is a little bit confusing to where it shows uh, another comma. So it should be last name, comma, first name, space, middle initial, period, all capital, right? That's exactly the way it should look. Social security uh, number, that's self-explanatory, rank, self-explanatory. Duty AFSC, right? This is another one where it has to match your shell report, right? So if there's a Q there, if there's an A there, make sure that it matches. And if it's incorrect, like we said, you got to go to mil PDS, get that updated. Uh, that'll update your shell report, and then, uh, then we can get those to match. That's the correct way to do it. Don't just, you know, change it on your EPR to match the shell report. If it's incorrect, let's get mil PDS updated, get your shell, uh, new shell report, and make sure that it matches. I think I'm done here. Do you have anything to add on this part of the... Yeah, your key duties, don't just copy and paste from the last person that had your job. Kind of tailor it, because even if you have the same job as the person that sat in that seat before you, you're going to do it different, and you can kind of tailor that to match how you're uh, performing. Just a right. quick question. Uh -huh. oh, uh, going back to the, uh, the days of supervision, uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, looking at that one, I think it was from like first December all the way till 
uh, yeah, one, one December to 30 November, and it says 275 days number super, number of days supervision. Yeah. What? How? How's that number calculated? I've, I've been always kind of wondering that because I, I see like sometimes random numbers <laughs> on the EPRs. Yeah, I think it'd be. I can simple. answer, but John John is chomping on the bit over there. To answer, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was gonna, I was going to make a comment on that. So a uh, common mistake is. Jake, as you read, number eight says period of report. That's literally not the same thing as the number of days of supervision. So they're two separate things. Period of report is just how long is this EPR covering? Number of days of supervision is how many days have you been supervised by your current supervisor? That, so they don't complain to the same thing. That information is also on what they call the rip or the shell, two different, which should be in your VPC site. And it should be in your binder as well. It's like number of days of supervision. So literally, like mine for my last CPR, for example, the number of days of the report period was a whole year because my last CPR fell on the scod. But my number of days of supervision since I switched offices and jobs two months before the EPR closed out was like 60 days. So it was really low. Gotcha. Cool. Good to know. Thanks. All right, next, we're talking a little bit about bullet placement. So if you read above where the bullets go, right? So it says one period, task, knowledge, proficiency, right? It's gonna walk you through what type of bullets should be in that section, right? So it should be that task proficiency, uh, task knowledge proficiency, right? Skill level upgrade training, duty position requirements, training, uh, of others, qualification, certification, motivation, right? All those things should be in that part, right? So whatever bullets you put in there should match that description above. And then same thing with the next one down, right? Followership, leadership, resource utilization, uh, complies with enforced standards, communication skills, right? Caring, respect, and dignified uh, environment, right? Teamwork type of things. Those are the things that should be in that, in that section. So a lot of times you'll see guys will just kind of like, throw bullets in there. It's like, uh, it doesn't matter where they go. I'm just going to put these bullets anywhere in there, right? But it matters because it, it tells you right above that these are the types of bullets that should go in that section. Now, and that's another thing that can take away from someone actually adding value. If they got to reorganize all your bullets because they're in the home class, it's just taking more time away from them when they could be adding more value to the support. Same thing here at the very bottom, whole airman concept, right? Air Force core values, uh, personal and professional development, esprit de corps, community, community relations, right? These are all those things that you should be putting uh, in here. Um, make sure that they those bullets match what the, the title is and what the, uh, what the bullets say. They tell you what they're looking for, right? So make sure that you're answering those questions that we say. Questions on any of that? All right, a little bit about uh, some of the um, signature block, right? So if you look at old Johnny B supervising here, uh, so his name is all caps, right? Like we said before, um, first name, middle initial period, and then last name. And then once you get into after that, right? Uh, so he's a master sergeant, so capital Five name. seconds from the ground, bold. I think you're, <laughs> hey Cole, you're, uh, you're unmuted. Are you gonna say something? Sorry. <laughs> Not ours. Uh, and then this is basically the way it should look. So if you're, you're putting this information in there and it's uh, incorrect, like we said before, right? If you emphasize attention to detail, making sure this information is correct. So then the next person looking at it doesn't have to spend time reviewing that um, and taking away from their time to, to enhance the report. And then uh, the title of this slide is Save the Best for Last, right? So we want to put our most impactful bullets uh, in these last, in, on the back side of it, right? So in these last three um, lines. Why is that? Let me ask somebody, Jake, I'm going to pick on you because I can see you. Why do we put our most impactful bullets, our best bullets, our most important bullets on the back of the report? All the way I've been kind of told is like that's where your you know seniors are going to be signing. That's kind of where their eyes are going to be, and also it's not crowded by a bunch of other bullets, so it's not a wall of text. So it's a little easier to spot these ones out. It's kind of kind of what I'm familiar with, anyway. Yeah. So so the important thing that that, that you mentioned before is like, hey, this is what your 
squadron, your senior leadership is saying about you, right? So when you read the board report, it says like, hey, what your leadership says about you um, carries the most weight, right? So that's why we put that information in the back because this is what your additional raider is saying about you. This is what your squadron commander is saying about you, right? So that leadership, this is what they are saying. It's not just you writing a bullet. This is uh, from the board's eyes. This is what your squadron commander is saying about you. This is what your, you know, uh, old, uh, this is obvious, Cap, uh, Captain Obvious here. He, uh, this is what he's saying about um, um, the, the individual for the report, right? So making sure that uh, what they say is the most impactful, right? So that's why we want to have the, the biggest bullets and the strongest bullets on the back. Suppose when you get to the board, they're going to have, they're going to read these probably, they don't have a lot of time. So you want to put all the important stuff in one spot. Yeah, and they, I've heard from several people on boards or whatever, they, they say, first thing they do is flip that report over, they read the back bullets, um, and they may like peruse the front bullets because they're, they're on a time constraint as well, right? So then they peruse the front ones, but they're gonna spend the most time reading, reviewing those ones on the back. What does your squadron command say about you? What is, uh, what is your what is your leadership say about you? So that's why it's important to put those ones at the end. Sergeant Redball, you got anything to add on that? Nope, Sergeant Barato uh, nailed it, right? The the most, uh, the commander, your ad rater, right? What they're saying about you um, just holds more weight than what your rater is saying about you. Uh, so that's it. This one didn't come out very, very good. Can you guys read that? Uh, so this is kind of a um, just a little guideline from from somebody to say like, hey, your your number one right in, in the first one, your from your additional radar. So the, the first block is your number one overall strongest internal, uh, external mentoring or volunteer bullet, right? So this is the one, um, and make sure that it's at that leadership level. And then. Um, below that is going to be your number two overall, right? So we'll talk about the uh, whole person concept. Overall, your number two strongest bullet. And then uh, below that, right, your, what, in the commander's block, what the commander is saying about you, that needs to be the strongest overall bullet. It needs to be at that highest level, right? Whether it be, you know, I, I'm making uh, accomplishments at the group or at the wing or, uh, you know, at the MAGCOM or whatever the case may be. That should be your highest level achievement and that should be your strongest bullet in that. And then like we talked about uh, before, right? Attention to detail, finalizing that report, making sure that, hey, you fill in that future roles piece. Um, let me read something. I know people always, I always hear people say, oh, that future roles doesn't matter. Let me read what the board brief says about that. Future roles may not serve as a veiled promotion statement, but must be, consi uh, but must be considered with the rest of the record in your overall evaluation, right? So they do look at it, they do care about it. They may not put a whole lot of weight into it, but it, uh, right here in the board brief, it tells you that um, it must be considered with the rest of the record in your overall evaluation. Uh, but you can't say like, hey, um, next uh, future roles is, uh, you know, if this is a text sergeant, master sergeant, blah, 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 right? You can't, you can't hide in there like, hey, promote this guy within that future roles. But it is uh, considered um, in the overall report. And this sort of goes into your progression too. Like, I mean, next week is there, did you actually fill that for future roles? So are you meeting that? Yeah, and then like we said at the very end, we make sure that we, we put in the, the remarks, all our acronyms and things like that. We spell that out. And as we update the report, we update that list as well. So make sure it's as accurate as possible. All right, now we're going to get into some examples. Let's see, who we got on? Is there a way I can see these people? Mm -hmm. Here, just a big square. Where? Yeah, I can't see on the mouse. Yeah, let me just go like this. All right. Uh, how about uh, Lolly? We're gonna start with you. Okay. All right, so let's look at this first bullet. 
Uh, I'm gonna make it big so everybody can see. So what do you see in that first bullet and what do you think um, it can be improved upon? So it says, Good Samaritan sacrificed personal time to assist a stranger in recovering a drift watercraft. And then something about unity, something. I can't read the last part. Um, okay, I'm not super great at bullet riding because I've been a okay. staff sergeant for like one week, but um, maybe the Good Samaritan part seems a little biased. Yeah, so it, it's that was not the, part of the thing we talked about earlier, right? The lead in part. Mm hmm. Um, kind of fluffy, right? Yeah, it's a little fluffy. Maybe you could pick a better word than assist and make that word a little bit stronger. Okay, how, how about when we quantify things? How, how does it look when we quantify? Does this quantify? No, it doesn't so it talk says, about who or how many or what you saved or the dollar amount that you saved. Yeah, absolutely right. Sacrifice personal time. Well, how much personal? Right. Right. Uh, so things like that. So you can identify those. Right. So we can kind of look at this and it, it leaves you, the, the bullet leaves you wondering. So it's, there's a question mark in my head. Say, like, well, how much time? Good Samaritan. What does that even mean? Okay. That doesn't add anything to the value of the bullet. Um, right. So these things you want to kind of review over that and just like start answering those questions. So sometimes you can start out with a bullet. And then you can go back and refine it, look at it a little bit more, right? So sometimes if you go away from, separate yourself from that and then come back to it, um, it can help you. Uh, Scott, what do, what do you see? What else can you add to that one? Uh, I know I, I, I personally don't like the, the term sacrifice personal time. Like, okay, it just seems like, I don't know. <laughs> Like I would, I would definitely gear to that and change it to something else. Um, I was just trying to think what that would be. Um, maybe like uh, uh, I don't know. I'm drawing a blank here. I'd, I'd need to whoever uh, whoever this was for. I'd have to talk to them just to get more of the story and figure out how to reward and make the bullet stronger. Yeah, and that, that's a, that's actually a really great point that you mentioned, right? So um, if you're a ready and you're providing your bullets for, to your supervisor, you know, it doesn't hurt to fill out a Word document, just tell it a story like, hey, this is what I did, right? And kind of make it um, in, in plain language and, and, you know, in a story format, in a paragraph format, go ahead and type that out and say like, hey, these are the things I did. This is what I'm trying to convey. And then maybe they can help you sit down and say like, okay, um, this is what your story is telling me, but when I read the bullet, it doesn't tell that story. So you can go back and rework that, and so they can help you um, make sure you accurately capture that that uh, that accomplishment. If you will. Yeah, when you're done reading the bullet, you shouldn't have many questions left for to see. It should tell the full story. Yeah, and like we said earlier, let other people read it, right? So in your mind, there may be no questions, but then I let somebody else read it. I let Sergeant Collins read it, and he goes in, he's like. What are you trying to say here? Like, I don't like um, sacrifice personal time. Well, how much time? You know, oh, okay, I didn't even think about that. Right. So let other people review it. Let peers review it. Let people above you, uh, outside of your unit, let let other people read it, and they can provide some insight. They can ask you some questions. And like, oh, I didn't realize I'm not answering that question. Um, let's look at the last bullet here. Uh, Instrumental in squadron org chart CPI, more than 65 outdated entries ID fixed, revamp, updated process, blah, blah, blah. Uh, anybody that wants to volunteer, go ahead. Uh, what, what's wrong with that bullet? All right, I'm gonna pick on some. There's no impact. There's no yeah. revamp up that process now, Wards. I, you wanna talk more about specificity um if they it's, yeah sorry go ahead what about that middle part more than 65 outdated entries id fixed well i mean all of these bullets are horrible but uh <laughs> every in every single way but um yeah so you just talk way too you use way too much space to talk about 65 outdated entries so you can shorten the heck out of that um and you actually it's also in, pass, it's in passive voice right 
Yeah. So, <laughs> more than 65 outdated entries ID fixed, right? So yeah. we want to be in, um, um, we want to be an active voice, not passive voice, right? So we would flip that around and we say ID slash fixed, and then you'd say uh, 65 outdated entries. When you say more than, just be accurate, right? So more than alludes to what? Is it 66? Is it 67? Six, you know, just go ahead and be accurate, right? So how many more than 65? So was it 67? So the better way to, to write it would be ID fixed 67 outdated entries, blah, 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 right? So instead of leaving it vague and more than 65, uh, be, be accurate. Um, don't, don't uh, as much as you can, don't, don't leave it vague or whatever, be specific. All right, we're, we're, uh, any questions about this? I, I don't wanna get too much time into this. I know we're uh, running up on the, our time frame for this. All right, let's, uh, I think that was the last slide. Uh, what questions does anybody have? Did that help? Did that answer any questions? Did that help give a little bit of guidance? I know for some of the, the younger folks in the room, uh, this is just kind of a, um, an opening of a door, opening a window, a little bit of insight to kind of some things that are gonna happen in the future, but um, I think more information is better. Um, to have it earlier is better. Some of these things I wish I had uh, when, I was, when I was younger and coming up, um, so. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, good question. Um, Okay, well, let me stop sharing. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering who will usually be reviewing our EPRs? Okay, I think you, you joined late. Let me let me show you. We'll go back to the beginning. Can you see that? Yeah, can you see it? I see it. Okay, cool. So uh, like we mentioned before, it's uh, so you're, you, right? You want to help develop it, right? Because you want to take control of your career and then it's going to get, your supervisor is going to look at it. From there, it's going to go to his supervisor, right? His supervisor is considered your additional rater and then it's going to go within your flight leadership. So like your flight chief, uh, your flight commander, they're going to look at it. Then it's going to come to one of us uh, in the chief uh, loadmaster or, or flight engineer office. We're going to review it. Uh, then it's going to go up to the squadron superintendent. Uh, first sergeant's going to look at it. He's more quality of force. Like, hey, did you did this person get in trouble for for whatever reason? Make sure uh, that that's captured as well. It's going to go to the uh, execs and then uh, eventually to the commander. That answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, cool. What else? Uh, I got a question starting to check as far as like um, yeah. uh, EPRs and stuff like that. So I know like I've always had problems writing down, I guess like numbers and stuff like that when it comes to yeah. like aircraft parts and stuff like that where it's pretty much like okay like you repaired an LRU and this LRU costs like $500,000 where do we find that information if it's like you know we saved you know x amount of parts or something like that or relayed x amount of parts like where do we quantify that is it through the maintenance downstairs or is it something like we're able to look up ourselves yeah most of that would, is going to come from um so supply right so, so supply is the ones who uh can look up those stock numbers or whatever, look up those part names. Um, they can look in what used to be fed log. I don't even know what the, the, the system is anymore, but they can look it up and it'll tell them what the value is of that part. Um, so yeah, you would, you would have to really kind of work with our, our maintenance brethren and uh, get some information from them. Hopefully they can help you provide that. Some of the numbers are standard numbers, right? So it's like, how much does a C5 cost? How much does an engine cost? The bigger things. But I think what you're referring to is, is kind of smaller components. And so a lot of those things, we don't know the value of them. So we'd have to go do some research on that. But I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, no, that's part of what you said about doing research in the slide. I just try, you're going to have to network with some people and kind of, even the crew chief might know. Because the crew chief's working on this stuff all the time. 
answer. I think EPR has something about the value of it. True. And also, I guess with some of the cargo loads, I know it's more a little bit pertinent with the uh, space canisters where it's like, okay, transported a $4 billion satellite, but it's like some stuff where it's like, okay, transported um, X cargo that costs 300 million. It's all like, where the hell are they getting these numbers at? So it's, I just kind of want to ask that question because I know a lot of people throw that in EPRs is kind of like, well, this is worth this much. And it's like, well, how do you prove that? That way we vet it to you guys. And it's not just, where'd you get this number from out of nowhere? Yeah. So a lot of the stuff, especially if you go into like uh, in Iraq, we were dropping off stuff that they purchased from us. Some of that stuff has receipts right on it and it'll tell you the value. Like, hey, this is 1,000 pairs of pants valued at $40 each, so it's $40,000 of pants. You know, and it, right on the side of the, the package and the manifest, sometimes the value of the cargo is right there. Yeah, cool. and some of those, big, those big ticket items are, are public knowledge, right? With a helicopter or a tank or something like that, that's public knowledge, right? So you can just look that up on the internet and you'll say, hey, a, an Apache costs, you know, X uh, number of millions of dollars. So you can just look that up. Good question. It's also it brings up a good point to where it's like, hey, keeping track of that stuff throughout the year, right? Uh, an EPR, a performance report, is a culmination of a year's worth of accomplishments. So making sure that you're tracking that throughout the year. So it's like, I get to the end of the year, I'm like, man, I can't remember what I did 12 months ago, right? So making sure that you keep an accurate and uh, keep a kind of running tally of those bullets, work on those bullets. We talked about writing a bullet, leaving it alone for a while and then coming back to it. That's a great opportunity, right? So after I finish uh, a mission, let me go ahead and write out the bullets from that mission, right? And then now when the quarter comes up, boom, I already got a, you know, uh, a quarterly package or when, um, when my EPR comes due, boom, I got all the plethora of bullets. And then you can go back to those and revamp them and improve them and enhance them. Like, oh, I'm, you know, when I read it six months from now, you know, if I'm asking myself questions like, what was I trying to say back there? Then you can realize like, hey, somebody else reading this won't be able to understand it. Anyone else got any questions? Yeah, a quick question. Um, recently, I, I, I never felt like I was going to lose my driver's license by uh, doing an EPR. However, uh, uh, could you elaborate on the term speeder? <laughs> what was that? Uh, I was trying to turn you up. Can you, can you say that? I, I missed the last part. That you, talking about could you elaborate on, on the term speeding? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't think I use the term speeding, but maybe I did. Um, but speeding, uh, <laughs> good, good, good question. Uh, that's the same kind of thing we were referring to before, right? Saying language that everyone understands, right? Everyone can, uh, everyone can, is on the same page. If, if I say speeding and somebody doesn't understand that, right? I need to know that so then I can properly convey that message. So uh, great, great question, great point. So when you talk about speeding, it's like, Hey, I'm reaching too far. I'm stretching the truth on this. I, I'm I'm going past the point of what the impact actually was for this person, right? So if it's like, hey, I took some cargo to uh, Saudi Arabia, that means that I opened that base, right? I, I saw that before. It's like, hey, I single-handedly opened uh, uh, Prince Sultan Air Base, blah blah blah, by delivering some cargo, and it's like, well, that's a little bit of a stretch, right? So that's speeding a little bit. It's like, hey, you bring it back to within the speed limits, right? Fifty-five is the speed limit, whatever case may be. Uh, so you don't get caught doing those things. So it's just like stretching, reaching a little bit too far. We got a hand up. Oh. B bolstering. What's that? <laughs> I got a question for Senior Rival if he's still on. And or you guys, uh, if you've been to the, uh, if you've been to any of these um, group uh, selection boards, uh, he, he's on. Yeah, I'm here. Have you have any any of you three uh, or any best in the room? I just figured it would be most likely you, gentlemen, heard of any of the new ops chief uh, or uh, ops commander like uh, things they like or don't like because EPRs change a lot with you know, the time and date where you are. Uh, and as each new person comes in, like, for example, Sergeant Nemechek put up there that the ops group commander doesn't like the word for, he likes to be spelled out as much as possible. Have you been privy to any kind of insider information with the new ops group commander or ops uh, chief? 
that would help us? I, I have not heard um, anything. Nothing has come down in the way of right professional writing. I don't like this word, right? Like, uh, you know, you'll get some stuff sometimes and people don't like using right handpicked, right? Like that'll be like some, I have not heard of any of those um, tendencies or preferred uh, words from uh, Chief Fierro or Colonel Johnson. And the second part is, uh, can, can, can we come to w with you? Can you ask or figure out if, if the next time they have one of those, if eyes of wars and decks and maybe the two chief load and engineer could go with you guys to kind of like see how the thing goes. What, what meeting is this? Uh, any kind of EPR reviews or, or awards submissions or anything that we can for quarterlies or whatever annual. So we can kind of get an insight into the work there, the minds above our squadron. Sure. So uh, just kind of uh, insider baseball chief Frappier is taking a look at our awards uh, process, how we board awards, uh, what they value on awards, which in turn, right, just for everyone's essay, right, this awards feed into EPRs, right? So um, so we're gonna kind of revamp how we do awards. I don't wanna ch steal Chief Fraps thunder, but uh, it's gonna be, right, twofold, right? If you sit on an awards board, you start to understand what the group values and in turn, uh, what the wing values, what the Air Force values, uh, just to give you kind of a leg up on, uh, you know, being uh, promotion eligible, how your EPR is looked at, that kind of stuff. Um, so more to come on that, Sergeant Zolanis. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, uh, John, you bring up a good point. It's just like anytime you know, we get that information. The goal is to provide that feedback as much as possible. So uh, as we get that information, we're going to pass it down right through venues like this or, uh, you know, whether it be an email or just kind of one-on-one -on -one sessions in CTs, things like that. So the goal is to give as much information. I'm not trying to hold on to anything. Up. I want uh, as much as possible everybody to have that information. So it's a great point. Keep asking. Um, we'll keep asking uh, so we can get as much info as possible. All is power. And that's a little cliche, but it's true. All right, what else you got? Any last questions, last save rounds, parting shots? All right, I think we'll end it here then. Thank you very much for, for joining in. Uh, I thought it was, uh, that was good. I thought it was useful. I appreciate your guys' uh, interaction and attendance. Uh, so if you guys have any questions that you didn't want to ask in here, hit us up in the hallway or something like that. Uh, that's all I got. Yeah. Slide the DMs. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Yeah.